over here. Uh, one thing we're going to do different next week to celebrate Easter is that we're not going to have the Sunday school, normal Sunday school hour. Uh, we won't be having classes or the adult prayer. We're going to have a, a fellowship breakfast. So we would invite you to come and be a part of that. And I think they were running an announcement a few minutes ago about uh, where you can sign up for what you would like to learn in terms of food. Also, Alex and Rachel are getting married this coming week. So we want to pray for them. Come on up here. We want to pray for them. And before I leave us in praying for them, I'll just uh, let them tell you any details or particulars that they would like for you to know. So Rachel said, <laughs> Rachel said I'll have to speak, so I'm speaking. Um, we are super excited, at least I am very excited, <laughs> to get married. Uh, and we really wish uh, that we could have one big wedding with everyone, but it's just unfortunately didn't work. So we decided to make it really small. Uh, and so you guys are all invited to live stream our wedding. Uh, it's next Saturday at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and we sent out an email to the email addresses that we had from y'all. And if we don't have your email address uh, and you want that invitation, please get it to me uh, or Rachel, just meet us after the service um, or find some way of contacting me. Uh, someone else here probably got that email and can forward it to you. Uh, it will be a Facebook live stream um, and you can watch it from there. Uh, then later, hopefully, we'll celebrate uh, with you guys more. Uh, but thank you so much for. Uh, the support in our relationship, uh, and just the wisdom uh, I know uh, from the men's group on Wednesday and stuff like that. Like I really feel uh, that I can go to those guys and ask uh, for help uh, in my relationship because a lot of them have been there. Uh, I think for Christian Rachel as well. Uh, we love our church. Uh, we want you guys to be part of our relationship. So thank you. Okay, you guys join me in praying again. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, for bringing Alex and Rachel together. We thank you for bringing them to the Grace Bible Church. And we thank you for what you're doing in their lives and what they're going to do uh, with them as a married couple in the future. Thank you that you have good plans for them. Uh, plans to give them a hope and a future. And we ask, Father, that you would just make your name known through the love that they have for one another. We pray, Father, that you would be glorified in their marriage and that the world would be able to see a picture of and his love for the church and the way that they love one another. And Lord, we know that they probably still uh, have many plans and details to work out uh, for what is to be this coming week. And we ask that you would give them wisdom and peace and joy and that this would just be a time they can look back on and remember your goodness toward them. Just bless them in every conceivable way for the sake of your name. We pray that Note to self, do not stand in front of the speaker when you're talking in the microphone. <laughs> Psalm 103, verses 1 through 4. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your assurance. We thank you for giving each of us hearts and minds and voices toward you. We ask that you would receive this worship from us now. In Jesus' name. Okay, let's stand. Or we will uh, have our song in Jerusalem. All of our songs this morning are about one thing, and that is the cross, because next week is Easter, Easter which makes this week the, uh, the cross. Yes, yeah, so. We've got songs that are all about what Jesus has done for us.
open our hearts as we hear the word of the Lord from Isaiah 44, 21 through 23. Remember these things, O Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud, and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O deeps of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and will be glorified in Israel. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your continuing grace toward us, that we are able to come and meet here freely, even now. I thank you for your word, that it may still be preached. And I thank you for your spirit, that it does not fall on deaf ears and hard hearts. Father God, I pray for the service. I pray that hearts and minds will be changed, and that you will be glorified. I pray, Father, that what is spoken today will be heard, and the message that you will preach today will change our lives tomorrow, and the next day, and the next, and that this week especially we may remember, as you have called us to do, that you came as a man and gave your life so that we could do this, so that we could glorify you and have of our full salvation. And it is in your name I pray these things. Amen. Stand with me again, please. We'll sing Jesus and take it all. <laughs>
Father, we come to you this morning, thank you that the gospel is true, and thank you, you Holy Spirit, that many times as we sing these songs here, that you come to us, and with no words, you say to our hearts, Christ died for you. 
thank you for that assurance. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you that he is our substitute, our Savior. And thank you that we do not have to die in our sins, but we can die in Christ and live forever with him. We praise you for that, Father. Thank you for the gift of your Son. And we pray that as we look at your word this morning, <clears throat> that he will be exalted. Lord, we want to focus on the cross this morning. And so many of us think we know all that there is to know about the cross, and we need to move on to something else. But this is the center of the Christian life. It is the focus and center of all human history. And so we ask that you would give us an appreciation for the cross of Christ this morning that we've never had before. We ask, Father, that you would enable each one who is listening today, either in person or over the Internet, to have a supernatural ability to hear the truth, to believe the truth, to receive the truth, and to rest on the merits of Jesus. Pray, Lord, for myself. Help me to speak as one speaking the very words of God. Don't let me say anything that's untrue, anything that will be hurtful. And Lord, I pray uh, that where there are truths in this message, that many people have probably never heard before. That they would examine the scriptures to see whether these things are true. And that we would want to know the truth of the word and not some Americanized version of it. And Father, we just want to ask that you warm our hearts to you and to your Son, to the Holy Spirit, during this upcoming week as we anticipate Easter, we pray that you would enable each one of us to draw near to you with a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And that you would touch us and grow us during this Easter season. And make us more ready to meet you and more ready to be used by you. Thank you for your great grace, your inestimable love. And your magnanimous mercy. We thank and praise you for the goodness that is you, O oh God. And we pray that that goodness would be evident as we look at the word. Amen. Okay, Matthew 26. Let's read the first four verses. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming. And the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. So, today is Palm Sunday. Uh, this is the Sunday that Jesus entered into Jerusalem to live the last week of his life. Now, we're not going to read any texts about Palm Sunday because we were at Palm Sunday in the Gospel of John about eight weeks ago. But this is the beginning of uh, what is called Passion Week, uh, the last week of Christ's life. And before uh, this week is over, Jesus will die on the cross on Good Friday. He will give his life as a ransom for sinners. The cross is the central event in the life of Christ. The cross is the central event in all of human history. The cross is at the very heart of the Christian faith. And so, let's ask this question. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Wouldn't you think that that was a simple question to answer? What was the central purpose of his death? You would think that would be as easy has fallen off a log. But there are so many people who claim to be Christians and so many churches that claim to be Christian churches that cannot answer this one simple central question. What is the primary purpose of Jesus' death on the cross? Some believe that the central purpose of his death on the cross was to be an example of perfect devotion to God. In other words, a lot of Christians, Christians, Think that Jesus died to inspire us. 
Some believe that Christ's primary purpose uh, in dying on the cross is to show the human race how much God loves us. And indeed, we do see the love of God at the cross. But is that the central purpose of the cross? No, it isn't. Others believe that Jesus died on the cross to show us how much God hates sin. And that when we see uh, how much God hates sin as he uh, lets his own son hang there and die, then somehow we are going to get our act together and pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and stop sinning. That, that would be like a governmental theory of the atonement. Still others believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay some kind of uh, ransom to Satan so that Satan would set us free from bondage to sin and hell. But none of these answers tells us the fundamental, vital reason for Jesus' death on the cross. The cross accomplishes many things, but only one thing is central and primary and foundational. One purpose of the cross uh, makes all the other purposes and effects of the cross possible. And that's what we want to focus on today. And we see this central, fundamental purpose of the cross spelled out clear as day in the writings of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. So turn there with me, if you will. Isaiah 52, 13. <clears throat> The chapter breaks in the Bible are not inspired, and this is one of the worst ones. <laughs> uh, don't, don't know why the gentleman that did the chapterizing of the Bible didn't slide the 53 up to 52.13, because it is certainly part of that servant song there. Now, Isaiah wrote these words 700 years before Jesus died on the cross. Uh, if Crucifixion did not even exist. It, it was not even practiced. It was not even known when Isaiah wrote these words. So uh, let me just speak to you very briefly today. If you're a person who does not believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, you tell me how this man wrote this detailed, articulate, uh, descriptive picture of the death of Christ on the cross 700 years before it happened. Can you explain this to me if you don't believe in the inspiration of Scripture? Oh, well. I'm a liberal scholar, and I believe that there were two authors of Isaiah, and I believe that one of them wrote uh, the second half of Isaiah 300 years later. Well, explain to me how that dude got it right 400 years before Jesus died on the cross, okay? This chapter is one of the greatest testimonies to the inspiration of the Word of God that exists in all the Bible. Uh, this is, in my opinion, the greatest chapter in the Old Testament. And so we want to see uh, what Isaiah tells us it's the central and primary purpose of the cross of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to pick up in 52.13 and read all the way down to the end of chapter 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. That's a term that refers to a battle plan that succeeds because of the wisdom of the plan. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So, Isaiah tells us what the central purpose of the cross of Christ was. In this servant song, really the, the apex or the central stanza of this servant song is verses 4 through 6. Let me read it to you, uh, emphasizing the pronouns. And, and you see, if you can tell me when I'm done reading 4 through 6 again, what the central purpose of the cross is. Verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. You get the picture? Uh, we, him. Uh, he, us. It's substitution. The central purpose of the cross is that Jesus died as a substitute for sinners. And so, in Isaiah 53, we see three things that make Jesus the perfect substitute for sinners. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Three things that make Jesus the perfect substitute for sinners. The first is this. He identified with us in our condemnation. He identified with us in our condemnation. Look at verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And so this word for in your English translation is a Hebrew word that denotes cause and effect. Okay? In other words, he was pierced because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Look at verse 8. The end of verse 8. Makes the same point. It says he was cut off out of the land of the living, living, stricken for, same Hebrew word that denotes cause and effect, stricken for the transgression of my people. In other words, stricken because of the transgression of my people. What Isaiah is trying to tell us is that there was a cause and there was an effect in the death of Jesus. The cause was our sin. The effect was his death. He was cut off out of the land of the living. Our sin caused his death. Not just some nebulous sin in general. The text says our sin. What I'm saying is the specific sins of specific people, Jesus died as a substitute to bear. He died for the transgression of my people. If Jesus died as a substitute for sinners, it had to be because of the specific sins of specific sinners. 
Jesus stood in the place of what the New Testament calls the elect to bear God's wrath against their sin. He is the substitute who died in the place of his people. He is the substitute for those uh, that verse 1 refers to when it says, To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Christ died for those to whom the Spirit would reveal the arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord is the saving work of Jesus at the uh, cross of Christ. Jesus bore the specific sins of every person who would believe in him, past, present, Let's think about this question. According to Isaiah 53, what causes a person to become a child of God by trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of sin? How does Isaiah say that a person goes from being an enemy of God, an unconverted person, to a child of God, a Christian? What causes that to happen? The fact that Jesus died in that person's place as a substitute. Isaiah says that not only is sin atoned for at the cross, Isaiah says that the substitutionary death of Jesus leads to the personal conversion of men and women. Look at this at the end of verse 10. Last half verse 10. When his soul, that will be Jesus, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, what's going to happen? He's going to see his offspring. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he will see his offspring. In other words, those who become God's children or God's offspring are the people that Jesus becomes a guilt offering for. Once again, there's this, this cause and effect logic going on. The cause, Jesus gives his life as a guilt offering. The effect, conversion, he's going to see his offspring. In other words, those for whom Jesus offered himself are converted. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he will see his seed, his offspring. It's as if the substitutionary death of Christ is the seed, and conversion is the plant or the fruit that grows up from his death. A person trusts in Christ because Jesus became a guilt offering for that individual. This is said at repeated places in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is one of the clearest. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul talking to believers in the church at Corinth says, For our sake, for our sake, he made him to be sin. Who knew no sin? Paul says this to the believers in the church at Galatia in Galatians 3.13. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For us. Paul says, you believers in Corinth, you believers in Galatia, Christ became a curse for us. Christ became sin for us. I want you to think about this, brothers and sisters. Uh, do you often find that your love for the Lord and your zeal to know him and to make him known uh, is weak or relatively non-existent. Do you want to love Christ more and have more zeal for him? Then you have to realize that when Christ hung there on the cross, that he identified with you, brother, and you, sister, personally. Personally. That he bore the personal condemnation that you personally deserved for the specific sin that you yourself have personally committed, are committing, and will commit. If you want to have zeal for the Lord Jesus, you must realize that God loves you personally, and specifically, and individually. Listen to how this awareness of God's personal, specific, sin-bearing, atoning love at the cross fueled the zeal of the Apostle Paul. Listen to this. This is Galatians 2.20. Paul said this. He said, I, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me 
and gave himself for me. Paul said, I'm living a life of sold out, faith filled, zeal for Jesus because I was crucified with him and he gave himself for me, not some nebulous, amorphous blob of unknown people out there. Christ said, He died for me. Church has this personal, specific love. This awareness that Christ substituted himself for you at the cross has this dawn on you yet. This awareness that Jesus loves you and gave himself for you has the magnitude of God's specific, personal affection for you as a believer in Jesus Christ dawned on you yet. When he does, in a broad way, in this land, then the church will get on fire for Jesus. We will escape the semi-Pelagian captivity that we have been under for the last 100 years when we can say, I was crucified with Christ. He loved me and he gave himself for me. In other words, Jesus saved me. I didn't save myself through my decision for him. When we get there, then we're going to have some revival. So what makes Jesus such a perfect substitute for sinners? First, he identified with us in our condemnation. Second, he was unstained, unstained by sin. Look at verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. <coughs> he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. He, he never done anything to hurt anybody. He never said anything he shouldn't have said. None of his actions were wrong. None of his motives were sinful. He was clean inwardly, and he was clean outwardly. He remained sinless, in spite of the fact that Christ was tempted to sin, to a degree that no other man has ever experienced. Have, have you ever thought about the fact that even though Jesus never sinned, he experienced temptation to a degree and with a force and with a power that no other man has ever experienced. Have you ever thought about that? Why, why, why was the temptation that Jesus experienced so much more forceful than, than the temptation that we experience? Because when it gets to a certain point for us, we cave in and we give in, right? Jesus never caved in. He never gave in. He endured the full power of temptation. We don't know the full power of temptation because we give in to it eventually. Jesus never did. And yet he remained blameless. Look at verse 8. It says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. So on Good Friday... Between the hours of 2 a.m. and 10 a.m., it was time for Jesus to be tried. And during that eight-hour time span, he endured six bogus trials. Three at the hands of the Jews, three at the hands of the Romans. And so, between 2 and 10 a.m., he was first tried by the ex-high priest, Annas. Uh, then he was tried by the current high priest, Titus. Then he was tried by the whole Sanhedrin and found to be a blasphemer worthy of death. Then he was sent to Pilate, and Pilate tried him. Pilate didn't know what to do with him, so he sent him to his buddy Herod. Herod mocked him and made fun of him, questioned him again. And then Herod sent him back to Pilate. And Pilate finally capitulated and gave in to the demands of the Jews and sentenced Jesus to crucifixion. How much self-control would it have taken to endure six bogus trials in one night, in a time span of eight hours, and to hold your tongue, to be falsely accused and mocked and stripped and beaten and deprived of the due process of law, and yet he opened not his mouth. Look at verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. In spite of enduring the full force of temptation, Jesus never gave in. 1 Peter 2, verses 22 and 23 refer to this uh, portrait that Isaiah gives us of Jesus not opening his mouth. 1 Peter 2, 22 says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. 
So Jesus experienced temptation to the point of death, yet he remained without sin. In fact, he was so upright, he was so blameless, he was so sinless, even in the face of obscene cruelty and injustice, that when he said, it is finished, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, there was a centurion at the foot of the cross watching. Do you remember what he said? Luke 23, 47, the centurion uh, said this, certainly this man was innocent. He was innocent. During the first Passover, when the Jewish people were in bondage in Israel, God told Moses to have them kill a lamb and to smear its blood over the doorpost. Do you remember that? And God promised in Exodus 12, 13, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague will befall you, to destroy you, when I strike the land of Egypt. But this blood that was smeared over the doorpost could not be just any old blood. Uh, it had to be the blood of a perfect lamb or a perfect goat. Listen to this. Exodus 12, 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. In other words, if you want the death angel to pass over you, don't kill some lamb that's got the mange. Don't kill a lamb with three legs. Don't kill a lamb that's blind in one eye. Kill a lamb that's perfect, a lamb without blemish, and smear the blood over the door, and the death angel will pass over you. Because Jesus was perfect and he had no sin of his own to pay for. He could die as a substitute. He could die in our place. He was able to pay the penalty for our sin, perfectly qualified, a lamb without spot or blemish. Let me ask you this. Have you lived a sinful life? Have you said and done and thought things that you're ashamed of? Things that are wicked, things that are detestable. Do you know what would happen if we could plug that computer, computer screen right there into your brain right now and start playing the things that you thought over the course of the last 20 years in front of everybody in here? Every one of us would get up and leave red faced. We would leave ashamed. Every last one of us. Let me ask you this would you like to have a clean conscience? Then trust in the sinless Jesus and he will make you clean. He will give you a clean conscience. Listen to Hebrews 9, 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If you want to have a clean conscience, look to the Lamb who for sinners was slain without spot or blemish. The gospel is good news because the sinless blood of Jesus will make the vilest, raunchiest, most depraved, wicked, detestable sinner clean. His blood is infinitely potent and infinitely powerful to take away the most despicable sin imaginable because his blood is sinless blood. Well, Jesus is qualified to be this perfect substitute because he identified with us in our condemnation. That was the first thing. Secondly, because he was unstained by sin. And finally, because he is perfectly pleasing to God. Have you ever thought about how pleasing Christ is to the Father? You see, there can be no salvation unless God is satisfied. What makes sin such a big deal? What makes sin such an eternal crisis is the nature of God. God is many things, but in front of any attribute that you would use to describe God, you better put one word. Holy. God is holy. His love is holy. It's a holy love. His wrath is holy. It's a holy, holy wrath. His wisdom is holy. It's holy wisdom. His kindness is holy. It's holy kindness. Everything about God is holy. And until his holiness is satisfied, there can be no salvation for sin. Isaiah tells us that Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice for sinners is perfectly pleasing. It is perfectly acceptable to God. 
Jesus perfectly satisfies the demand of God's holy justice. Do you see this in verse 10? Look at verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Uh, some of you might be reading from a different translation that says this. It pleased, it, it pleased the Lord to crush him. There's even one translation that says it delighted the Lord to crush him. What is so pleasing to the Father? about the death of his son. Is the father just this sadistic person, uh, the, the kind of person who likes to stick a knife in somebody but tie it up and just twist it and watch him squirm? No, that, that's not the sense in which the father is pleased to crush his son. Behind the envy of the Jews and the spineless compliance of Pilate and the crowds that are yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, is the divine management of the father who is crushing his son under the weight of my people, the sins of my people. Imagine a father who is a highly decorated Marine, and his son comes to him one day and says, Daddy, I want to be a Marine too, and I'm going to go to boot camp, and I'm, I'm even going to join the SEALs, and I'm going to go overseas, and I'm going to fight for our country. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be in some of the most hostile war zones on planet Earth. What would the father think? The father would think, I, I don't want to see my son die. But boy, I'm proud of him. He, he's giving his life for a noble cause. He, he's giving his life for something that matters. And so I'm so pleased with my son. And that's the sense in which the father is pleased to crush his son. In John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, Jesus says this. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. There's Jesus hanging on the cross, dying for sinners, not because he has to, of his own accord, because he loves his Father. It pleases his Father. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. When the Father sees the Son accomplishing the Father's will, He is pleased. Remember last week at the end of John 14, what Jesus said? He said in John 14, 31, He said, the ruler of this world is coming. He's got no claim on me. In other words, Satan can't make me do anything. But I'm going to the cross. And Jesus said this, so that the world may know that I love the Father. It was the will of the Lord. It pleased the Lord to crush him. This is why the Father is so delighted in the sacrifice of the Son. Jesus is perfectly pleasing to the Father. Would you like to be pleasing to God today? Would you like to be acceptable to God today? Would you like for God to delight in you today? Then look to the one the Father was pleased to crush. The one whose sacrifice is perfectly pleasing to God. You will never be pleasing to God, and you will never be acceptable to God on your own merits. If you want to be pleasing and acceptable to God, He's pleased with His Son. He's pleased with His Son's substitutionary sacrifice for sinners. And if you look to His Son to make you clean, He'll be pleased with you. If you're in Christ today, then God delights in you because He delights in the saving work of His Son. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2 talks about how pleasing His Son's substitutionary death for sinners was to the Father. And Ephesians 5 2 says, Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What did the Father think about the Son's sacrifice? It, 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 it was a fragrant offering. It was pleasing. It, it smelled good to him, so to speak. Look with me, if you will, at verse 6. Isaiah says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
So at the cross, God himself acts to satisfy the demands of his own holy justice. A theologian named Alec Motier says this. He says, quote, The death of Jesus is the intersection point of all space and all time. From north, south, east, west, past, present, and future, the divine hand gathers in the sins. Of all the sinners he proposes to save and personally conducts them to a solemn and holy spot, the head of his servant, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now this picture of sin being transferred to a perfect substitute, this was a normal part of Old Testament Israel's uh, regular worship routine. In Leviticus chapter 1, uh, it says, For a burnt offering... Take a male without blemish from your herd. Bring it to the tabernacle and put your hands on its head and have the priest slit its throat and catch the blood in a bucket. And then have him take his fingers to the blood and throw it against the sides of the altar. But before that happens, you put your hands on his head and that is symbolic of the transfer of sin from the worshiper to this perfect sacrifice. On the Day of Atonement, Old Testament Israel would kill one unblemished goat for the sins of the people. And then Aaron, the high priest, would take another unblemished goat called the scapegoat. And Aaron would lay his hands on the head of the scapegoat. And he would confess three things. He would confess Israel's iniquity and transgression and sin, symbolically laying these things on the head of the goat. And then they would send the goat off into the wilderness. And this symbolized the fact that the sins have been laid on a substitute and taken away from the people. Uh, the three things in Leviticus 16 that got laid on that scapegoat were, were iniquity, uh, sin, and transgression. With the words that Isaiah uses to describe our guilt in Isaiah 53, he identifies Jesus uh, as the fulfillment of the scapegoat. Th those are the three words that Isaiah 53 uses to talk about our sin. Did you notice that? Look at these three words. Look at Isaiah 53, 12, the, the very end of the verse. It says he bore the, the sin. He, he bore the sin of many. Now this is a word in Hebrew that means missing the mark. So sin is missing the mark. Uh, think about an archer drawing his bow back. He fires at the target. He says, did I hit the bullseye? It's like, no, you, you didn't even hit the paper. That's us. <laughs> it's not just that we missed the bullseye. We didn't even hit the paper. We've missed the mark. We've fallen short. Uh, that's what Paul says in Romans 3.23. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So Jesus died to pay the penalty for all our shortcomings. For the untold times in our life we failed to live up to what would glorify God. He bore our sin. Look at verse 5, second part of the verse. Not only did he bear our sin, it says he was crushed for our iniquities. What is iniquity? This is a Hebrew word that means crooked and bent and warped and twisted. Iniquity is the warped human nature that gives rise to all of our wrong thoughts and attitudes and actions. In other words, when it says he was crushed for our iniquity, what it means is Jesus died for our depravity. He died for our depravity. He was crushed not just for the wrong things that we've done, but for the warped, crooked, perverted people that we are. He bore our iniquity. King David, in Psalm 51.5, said this about himself. He said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, King David said, I was born a crooked stick. I was born warped. I was born perverse. I was born depraved by nature. Paul, in Ephesians 2, 3, speaking to the Christians at Ephesus, says that before God saved them, they were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So Jesus died to bear the penalty for our iniquity, not just the wrong things we do, but the wrong people that all human beings are by birth. Our depravity. Then there's this third term that Isaiah uses to talk about 
what Jesus stood in our place to bear. Look at the beginning of verse 5. It says he was pierced for our transgressions. Now this, this is the, the most uh, damning and indicting word of all three. There's sin, iniquity, and transgression. Transgression just nails everybody to the wall. Yeah, so with sin, you say, okay, I missed the mark. I'm not perfect. And, and with iniquity, you just say, okay, I was born that way. Uh, but transgression means rebellion. It means willful sin. It means that all of us have seen things that are evil and wrong and that God hates and we said, I want that. It's conscious, willful rebellion against God. This word transgressions highlights the fact that on more occasions than we can count, we were presented with a choice and we consciously and deliberately chose the path of willful rebellion. In other words, uh, times without measure, we have sinned not because somebody made us or because we were born that way, but because we wanted to. And Jesus died to pay for that too. Now one reason that Jesus kept his mouth shut uh, like a, a lamb that before it, it shears is silent. One, one reason he kept his mouth shut is because he was submitting to the will of his Father. But another reason he kept his mouth shut during all these bogus trials is because he was taking our transgression on himself. Our willful rebellion. That sin for which there is no excuse. He was being condemned as a rebel, a criminal, a willful traitor, caught red-handed with no excuse to offer. If you're a rebel, if you're a willful traitor, if you've been caught red-handed, what do you do when you stand before the judge? What can you say? Nothing. You just stand there with your mouth shut. And that's, a, that's one of the reasons that Jesus didn't say anything. He was standing in for us as a willful rebel against God. In Romans 3.19, Paul talks about how the mouth is stopped. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world held accountable. God. As Jesus uh, shouldered the load of our transgression, uh, what, what could he say? What could he say? He was bearing our guilt. He was bearing our shame. He was, he was our substitute. And so his mouth was stopped. When those who die in their sins stand before the judgment throne of God, there will be no arguing with God. Every mouth will be stopped. <laughs> you know, you, you see these people uh, and you probably know some of these people, and they just they do whatever they want. And you talk to them about it, you'll say, they say, when I die, I'm going to have some words with God. I'm going to straighten him out. I'm going to tell him what I think. You will say nothing. You will stand there with your knees knocking wide as a ghost and trembling all over. Your mouth will be stopped. There will be no excuses offered, no plea bargaining, no debate about the matter. There will be absolute silence. While the holy judge of the whole universe reads off the countless instances of transgression, of willful rebellion. He's got a book, Revelation says. He's kept a record of it all. Church, Jesus died for our rebellion and he kept his mouth shut in our place. Let's be encouraged today as we anticipate Easter, as we come into Passion Week that Jesus died for all our sin and all our iniquity and all of our transgression. He paid for all of our shortcomings, all our depravity, all of our willful rebellion. Brothers and sisters, we can rejoice today because all of our defilement is completely and totally and finally and forever and exhaustively dealt with at the cross. By the vocabulary he chose, Isaiah showed that Jesus dealt with sin in its totality. No debt left unpaid, no fault left uncovered, no stain left unremoved. The sacrifice of Jesus is perfectly pleasing to God. It covers every sin, every iniquity, every act of rebellion. There is no condemnation for you today if you're in Christ Jesus because Jesus paid it all. Willing, unwilling, accident, intentional. 
by birth, by choice, it's all been paid for. Death, brothers and sisters, is no longer a dreaded enemy for us. It is the door to life. God is no longer, brother, God is no longer, sister, an angry judge waiting to zap you with a hot lightning bolt. He is your Father through Christ Jesus. Oh, what joy we should have today. What relief we should have today. What a heart of love for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world we should have today. Well, as we come to a close, why did Jesus die on the cross? The, the primary, primary reason was to be a substitute for sinners. He died in the place of every person who would ever turn to him as Savior and as Lord. To pay the just penalty that we owe for our sin to satisfy the demands of the Holy God. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and what he calls all men and women to do in response to this message is to repent and believe. Okay. What does it mean to repent? Well, it means you go out and you get your life all fixed up and then you come back and say, God, do you, do you have me now? No, repent simply means this. You agree with God. You say, God, what you say about me in your word is true. I'm a rebel by birth and by choice. I'm a sinner. I've missed the mark. I'm crooked. I'm warped. You agree with God. You repent. You say, I believe what you say about your son, that he is the only one who can take away my sin. And then you put your trust in Christ. You stop trying to rely on yourself. You stop trying to rely on Jesus and your baptism or Jesus and your good deeds or Jesus and the fact that you don't drink alcohol or Jesus and anything. And you rest all the weight of your soul on Jesus, the Lamb who was for sinners slain. And the Word of God promises this, that if you will do that, you will be saved. Have you done that today? Uh, if, you, if you have done that and you've been baptized, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you have done that and you have not been baptized, Jesus calls you to be baptized in order to proclaim to the world that you belong to him and that he saved your soul. And, and if anyone does need to be baptized or needs to talk, uh, I'll be available after service. Feel free to come up and speak with me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, the scapegoat, the Lamb of God, the true Passover Lamb, and the one who bore all of our sin in his body so that we would never have to be. The one who was cut off from the land of the living so that we might live forever. And we pray, Father, that the message of the cross would never get old and boring and trite to us and that we wouldn't be the kind of people who want to hear the pastor talk about ten steps to successful business and five steps to losing some weight. Lord, help us to love the word of the cross. It's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. We thank you that we don't have to die in our sin. And we're thankful that these things are the one true truth in all the world. And we ask that you would seal them in our hearts even now. Amen. I'm going to let Ivy play a couple verses. We'll just pray during that time. And then we'll take communion. Mm -hmm.
come to the Lord's table, let this come with thankful hearts. If there is no sin that we ever have committed or committed, or will commit, that Jesus Christ is not perfect. Communion is for baptized believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's not you, do not come and take communion. Because if you do, you're mocking God. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians that you're eating and drinking judgment. After you receive the elements, hold them, and we'll all partake together. And Lee, if you and Alex would come and serve. same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Let's stand and sing to Lisa.
anything saved that they believe that. We bring glory to God and encourage the body. <laughs> uh, just, just a verse that uh, came to my mind as I was listening to the sermon. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 18, and 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Easter is a time where we remember what we have from God, but that, that remembering, that message, shouldn't stay with us. That would be a, a worse crime, I think, than any sin we could commit to let this grace, to let this glorious forgiveness stay with us. We have been entrusted the message of reconciliation, and I think it is our duty to God to take it to others. So I'd like to just encourage everyone here, if you know just a single person who, who would be inclined, invite them to church this Easter. It's it's one of the few times of the year where people come willing to leave church, and in this time in particular, likely no one's going to be inclined to come. But it, it, it is the glory that we have to share. So I encourage you to, to invite someone. Just a second. sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever.